very good morning to everybody. So let's start. Uh, we made some changes at our uh, institute while working to it. We started with what the Da Vinci operative manual told us and the proctor told us to start. So we started with so many ports and this and that, but realized over the time that, I mean, robotic surgery is just a tool and we are just doing a little advanced laparoscopic surgery. So why not modify it to our patients, to our type of surgeries, and to, of course, make it more economically viable to our patients? Well, myomectomy can be done laparoscopically, but then the questions are, can all myomectomies and can all surgeons do it? And like hysterectomy or myomectomy, it has not become a standard operative procedure for minimal access surgery, just like the surgeons do cholecystectomy. You never hear an open cholecystectomy, but you hear open myomectomy and open surgery uh, hysterectomy every day. So what are the three main concerns? One, you may take more time. We are all talking about it. How do you cut that? You make more ports. The laparoscopic surgeons will say, oh, we do it with three ports and two ports, and you make five. So what do we do? And of course, the cost which is the bottom line always. So let me take you through five modifications which I, over years, have slowly brought into my surgical practice. One is that I always do a preoperative MRI. I don't want to be in surprise once I get into doing myomectomy that it's an adenomyoma or the location is not very clear to me. Second is how to reduce the number of ports and instruments. I use V-lock, but I use a 30 centimeter. It's a little cumbersome to begin with, but then you get used to it. And I don't use any retromarcellator because there is some confusion in it and there is cost involved. And of course, I use a hybrid technique when I have a very large myoma. So preoperative MRI becomes a GPS for me. It tells me where my myoma is, and uh, even Dr. Garima will agree. We actually go to the MRI room, sit with my radiologist and say, show me the fibroids in 360 degree. And I make a diagram. These girls also make a diagram sometimes and tell me, ma'am, there is a fibroid, there is a fibroid. So we need to know exactly where we are targeting to make my hysterotomy incision useful and beneficial. Second is, of course, to identify the adoma and, of course, plan the type of surgery. So these are some of the fibroids which we have operated, large ones. But this is an adenomyoma, if you see. Reported on scan as fibroid, but this was not something that we needed to do. So these large myomas are, are very routine in our theaters, which are huge. Big, and as Anshu said, in the end, it takes almost the same time and effort to get them out of that small hole. Anyhow, so doing an MRI gives me an initial push to plan my surgery, so there's no time wasted in the OT trying to figure out where and what I should do. The second point is to reduce the number of ports and instruments. Now, how did we do that? If you see, this is how we were taught to put our place in the W, uh, inverted W shape, and that was the primary port and all those things. So we don't do, do this anymore. So this is what our abdomen was to look initially, but we have moved to only primary port, two ports which will give me the 8 mm, and I do a railroading, I'll just show you a video, and just one 5 mm port for my assistant to help me. And I stop putting a robotic tenaculum anymore, I use my uh, assistants to use a myoma screw, and they just help me. So that makes simple. So uh, there is, there is a, this is the railroad picture, but I have a small video. If they can just play it for you, you will realize that this is the port on my le uh, left side of the patient, which actually I put an initial 11 mm. If you can see, the primary port is on. This is a view from the right side of the patient. That is the one that is being held is the 11 mm port, and you can see an 8 mm being railroaded through a 11 mm. Now, the benefit of this is that that 11 mm helps me to push my needle, bring my needle. Otherwise, I would have to put another 11 mm at the upper part to be able to do that needle passage. So what happens is this you need, actually you can do this if you have the bariatric longer ports then you can railroad. And then you dock the arm onto the 8 mm and use that. So whenever you have to put a needle, so you just pull out the 8 mm, put the needle in and get the back. So you have reduced one port. Uh, doesn't matter in the cost because the ports are not consu uh, consum consumable, but it definitely reduces the number of ports for the patient. So that makes simpler for her to work. So this is how it looks. The next thing that we did is in reducing the number of instruments. When I started, I started with six fenestrated bipolar, scissors, tenaculum, progress forces, and I used to actually was taught to use two needle holders to do my suturing. Now actually I've cut down to three. I just put my fenestrated and my scissors from one and two arm, 
finish the surgery, and then put change my scissor into a needle holder, use the same bi fenestrated bipolar, and finish my suturing. So actually, 50% of the cost has come down just because of that. I'll just give you the cost analysis also in a minute. So this is the morselation that we do, and uh, I have been talking about it. We put it in a bag, bring it at the umbilical level, and that's the cold knife morselation that's going on. The, actually, the strips come out almost as if you had done an electrosurgical morselation. We also use the hybrid technology. When I say have a fibroid of more than 14 centimeters, 15 centimeters, almost up to the ziphy sternum, where do you put your ports for the robot? So what we do is we just put the initial ports, put, but then at that point of time, what you need to do is not do it as laparoscopy. Do it thinking that you have to do robotics. So initially put the 8 mm straight away and use your laparoscopic instruments through the 8 mm. So you don't waste time in changing the ports once you have done. So we initially do the myomectomy laparoscopically. And that's the advantage of having some kind of background laparoscopic experience, because that you can relate to. So immediately in 10, 15 minutes, the myoma is out. Doctor robot, do the surgical uh, reconstruction of the uterus, and then come out and do the morselation. So that cuts down the time, but the team is very important. You need to be planning with your team. You have to tell them what you are doing, not start telling them once the robot is docked or the patient is under anesthesia. So generally, we have a discussion 10 minutes before the case starts to all the nurse, to the technician, to the anesthetist, so that they are all in tune with me as to what we are trying to do. So swift docking and smooth execution of the procedure will cut down your OTK time. So this is some of the analysis that we do. I think I will skip this slide, but I will come down to this slide which Dr. Anshu was talking. Now, we analyzed our time as total time. Now, one is induction to extubation, so a lot of things go there. Then you have the console time, which is dependent on the surgeon as well as the case that you are operating. And the third is the anesthesia, morselation, docking, undocking, all those time. So if you see in the, in the chart here, the maximum, if you see the time here is between one to three hours. Now that's cutting down the time quite a lot. When I started doing myomectomy, sometimes it would even go for five to six hours. But I said, I don't have either the patients nor the patient has the money to pay, so let me do what I can. Then the console time is actually most of us is between one to two hours, depending upon the number of fibroids. Because if you have multiple fibroids, I've not talked that here, is to how to ensure that you don't miss them. So you have to put a bag or you have to string them. So that takes time. So multiple fibroids is a different ball game. But then, then as anesthesia, morselation times again depends upon the size of the fibroid that you have. I think our time of morselation is directly proportional to the volume of the fibroid that we have. So that's again an important factor there. So economy, how do we cut the cost? Now we targeted four things in our theater and strategies that we wanted to achieve. And I, I will take you through a percentage of total 100 units. And we are excluding the return of investment on the machine, because that is not my business. That is the hospital's business. And of course, I'm also excluding surgeon's charge, because I don't work in that system. I have a ability to cut down my charge so if I want to cut down the charge. So first thing that we did was target the anesthesia team. When we started, the NSCCA team was hungry, go, we have to put a central line, we have to put this and that. Then I told them it's just laparoscopy. I mean, we are finishing laparoscopy two, two and a half hours, this will get over in three, three and a half hours. So don't worry. So invasive arterial line, disposable compression stockings, new routine for what was the new routine. So now we reduce the consumable. We just manage it like a laparoscopy. So they are also very comfortable. So cutting down this, we could cut down the cost by 9%. The next we targeted how to reduce the operating time, which is the main issue and the main, at least in a private hospital, t operating time or operating theater time is money. So we targeted equipment. So we prepare everything even before the patient is induced. So that robotic technician has instruction that the robot should be docked. The tech, the everything, calibration, trolleys, everything should be ready before, because the time got, gets ticked the minute the patient is intubated. The second is port placement. We are ready. We are very set with what we do. So we just do it in within three or four minutes. Pre-op planning helps. And pre-op instructions to my assistants help. Instrument selection and placement. And of course, a swift undocking also reduces my cost. The surgery or the console time will depend upon the surgical experience of the surgeon. And of course, the case that you are doing, sometimes not very easy to manage. So prepare the team. Have a constant dialogue. Robotic technologist is important, the person who is assisting you all the time. And of course, the lead surgeon has to plan virtually. And I believe me, it's always on my mind the night before. It used to be more when I started, because I had to also call a robotic technician from Chennai. When I started, every time I posted a case, Mr. Srinivasan used to fly from Chennai. So in the night, I had to talk to him, what case is there? The whole night, I would think, where will I play my post? 
those things have become better now with a technician in our OT. So once we targeted the OT time, actually we reduced the OT time and the cost by about 7%. So what we started as 100%, now the cost came down to about 84%. The next was the hospital stay. Usually patients are geared to stay for more than three or four days. We counseled them, talked to them, told them, we used the ERAS protocol, early ambulation, early orals, less pain. So we have now cut down the hospital cost of stay by about 10%. So my total cost of robotic surgery from what I started has come down to about 75%. I've saved about 25% in these patients. The next was an upgrade policy, which I discussed with the hospital. And I told them, okay, fine, if the patients are less, uh, they can afford less, please put them on a general ward category. But we don't want to put our robotic surgery patients in general ward because they say, oh my God, I've paid so much money to be in general ward. So I said, please upgrade them and this happens everywhere, so they feel happy they got upgraded. So by doing that, actually we really cut down another 1 to 1.5% 1 in their cost. The last what target was targeted and made the real difference was to cut down the instruments. And that's the disposable cost which really hits us when we have the bill in front of us after doing a robotic surgery. So moving from six to three, actually cut down my cost by almost 15%. But however, you have to understand that from what we started, we have actually reached about 40, 58 to 0.5% of the total cost that we were doing. And that's the reason how we are able to make it more affordable to our patients and make sure that with these small modifications or these little tricks that we learned over the time, which I thought I'd share with this group so that we can all extrapolate that in our practice. And these are not the only Da Vinci is not the only robot that's there. This is a new robot called Versus developed by a UK company. And I believe this is going to be in any every NHS hospital by to March 2019. So you can imagine the amount of experience that this robot will develop, much smaller than what we have. There are, I think, four or five of them coming. So we, there is no going back from robotic technology. We have to take this along. We have to take it in our uh, patient population or wherever we are. And uh, this, will, this is probably going to stay. So I think I thank you all for uh, your kind attention. Thank you very much.